Hi there, my name is uh, Phil Corlett and I am an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Psychology at Yale and I direct the Belief, Learning and Memory Lab where we try to understand psychosis. So psychotic symptoms are the profound departures from consensual reality that characterize serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia. But in my lab, we're also interested in the extent to which these unusual beliefs and experiences are present, albeit in an attenuated form, in the general population. We think that this will provide insights not just into serious mental illness, uh, but also into things like belief and perception. Um, and theories of how the mind is mapped to the brain, ultimately. So one of the things that we do is focus on hallucinations, which are percepts without an external stimulus. This is a paper I published in Science with Al Powers and Chris Mathis recently, where we focused on multi-sensory integration, the bringing together of information from the different senses. Now, we previously thought for many years that perception was just a sort of passive receipt of sensory information. That information was incident on one of our senses and registered in the brain. But what we're showing here is that belief is really important and expectation. So much so that if beliefs are too strong, hallucinations might result. So we brought people into the lab and we had them go into the scanner and we performed a hearing test on, uh, during which we uh, figured out the intensities of different stimuli that we needed to present to their ears in order for them to register those stimuli. And then we paired them up, just like in Pavlov's original learning experiments. Here, the dog was learning about an association between food and sound. In our experiments, the human participants were learning the associations between a visual stimulus and a sound, the visual stimulus being a checkerboard. So in the scanner, we're pairing a one kilohertz tone of one of those different intensities with the checkerboard over and over again in the hope that we'll condition a perceptual expectation and perhaps a perceptual experience. Now remember there's tones of different intensities, that's gonna be really, really important. And those are paired with the checkerboard at different extents across the trials. People are asked to report to us whether or not they heard a tone on a particular trial and how confident they are in that particular uh, belief. So on trials where we show them the checkerboard, but we don't present a tone and they report hearing one, we're gonna call that a conditioned hallucination. And we ran this in four groups of people, healthy people who don't hear voices nor have psychosis, a group of healthy people who believe they were psychic, I'd be happy to talk more about them later on, um, they heard voices every day, a group of people with a psychotic diagnosis and no voices, and people who had both voices and a psychotic diagnosis. Everybody in the study heard some conditioned hallucinations. However, the people who heard voices in their everyday lives were most confident and reported the most conditioned hallucinatory percepts. Now we scanned their brains during um, the uh, experiment, both during, and in order to unpack what those responses meant, we modeled their uh, beliefs and choices and fit those estimated parameters to the imaging data. And what we find is people with the strongest beliefs were the people who uh, heard voices, and that was associated with excessive responses in the insula. And people with psychosis, regardless of their hallucination status, had most difficulty updating their beliefs, and that was associated with stronger responses in the cerebellum and parahippocampal gyros. Now, one of the things that we're doing now actively in the lab, COVID permitting, is trying to manipulate uh, nodes in that circuit in order to help people with voice hearing. These are just some preliminary data in a group of patients who heard voices every single day that were intractable to the treatments that we have available to us. Prior to the TMS session, they had voices and overall psychotic symptoms that were really rather severe. After four weeks of daily TMS to a region that was quite near to that superior temporal sulcus region that we showed in our conditioned hallucinations task, was responsive when people reported hearing tones that we didn't present them with. When we modulate that region every single day with inhibitory TMS, we can bring down the severity of their voices and the severity of their psychotic symptoms more broadly. So one of the studies that we're doing now is combining this sort of TMS procedure with our conditioned hallucinations task to see whether we can modulate people's performance on the task and get them to express fewer conditioned hallucinations. Um, as a function of whether or not they've had stimulation, excitatory or inhibitory, to the different nodes that were identified in the conditioned hallucination data I just showed you. 
what we found in that pilot study was indeed the extent to which people's uh, voices improved with that TMS procedure correlated with the change in coupling within uh, between two of the nodes that we identified in the conditioned hallucination circuit earlier. So the more that the superior temporal sulcus was coupled to the insula as a function of the TMS intervention, the more likely people's voices were and the more extensive people's voices were to improve. Now, I also mentioned that we're really interested in belief updating. Remember in that initial study, it was belief updating that was really a sort of harbinger of patienthood. Regardless of hallucination status, people found it very, very difficult to update their beliefs in light of new information. So that seems like something that we really ought to focus on if we care about what's different between clinical psychosis and these sort of continuum type beliefs. And what Erin Reed, who's a graduate student in my lab, she's now uh, completing her MD, uh, focused on in her, grad, in, in her uh, uh, thesis work was three different studies of how belief updating unfolds. An in-lab study of patients and controls with varying degrees of unusual belief. We focus particularly on paranoia because that's the most common belief that straddles both clinical case and is common in the continuum. Erin also developed a, a, an online platform for delivering the same task to individuals through Amazon Mechanical Turk, where we can leverage much, much larger samples of participants. And in collaboration with Jane Taylor and Steph Groman, we replicated uh, this task in rats who'd been administered methamphetamine. So what we do is compare across species responses to the same contingencies between cues and rewards and to the same changes in those contingencies. So we can expose human participants to probabilistic reversal learning where the, they're presented with three different options. The best option to choose delivers 100 points, um, but that best and sometimes occasionally probabilistically delivers a loss and sometimes uh, the best deck changes. And critically, in both of our studies, both the human and the rat study, halfway through the contingencies were compressed. So it became much more difficult to tell the difference between whether something was a probabilistic error, something that just occasionally happens, or whether indeed the underlying contingencies have changed. And both uh, in the rat study and in the human study, what we see is in high paranoia participants or in rodents administered methamphetamine, there is this sort of strange promiscuous switching behavior, which we're really trying hard to understand. It seems really rather irrational that after having gotten a win, having gotten the points or the food reward, um, the animals or the human participants actually switch between decks unnecessarily. So this excessive win switching is higher in people with higher paranoia. And we've sought in the lab to try and understand why that might be. It's not the case that people with lots of delusions stick to the best option, uh, even after it's changed, it's that they switch excessively. And without wanting to go into too much detail, we fit exactly the same computational model that we fit to the conditioned hallucinations data. Uh, now this time modeling the probabilistic reversal data. And I'm just showing you that across those three studies, the in-person in-lab study, the online study, and the methamphetamine study in rats, the changes in the underlying computational architecture uh, that aligned with paranoia or with methamphetamine status were almost identical across those three different studies. So the take home point would be online studies can recapitulate what we find in the lab, in person, in patients, and we can model those things in rodents too. And just to show you uh, how, how closely the changes in model parameters relate to one another, we ran a cluster analysis, which is where we take all of the model parameters from all of the different studies and see how they cluster together to see if there's a sort of underlying construct in the house. And that is indeed what we find. So we find two clusters uh, driven mostly by um, learning rate parameters that code uh, responses to unexpected uncertainty, but also prior beliefs of how, how much unexpected uncertainty that there really ought to be in the context of the task. And they group together our low paranoia participants and our saline rats into one group and our high paranoia participants and our methamphetamine rat group rats in another group. And you can see this really nice clustering, but also separation between the clusters. So we think indeed we're, we're honing in on something that's extremely relevant to uh, the belief updating changes. And the really nice thing is that we can investigate that more me mechanistically in rodent models. Um, and we can also look 
uh, across broad swathes of the population. Indeed, that's what we've been doing during the pandemic. I don't have data to show you on that right now, uh, but we've been tracking how the pandemic has been up impacting people's paranoia and how it's been changing their belief updating uh, in the context of this task and similar tasks. So that's something else uh, that we'll be working on and actively following up on in the lab going forward. The other thing that we're doing is to try and leverage this information to actually do something useful clinically. So we know, for example, that there are a group of people around their sort of early teens, uh, sorry, late teens and early 20s, who are at what we call clinical high risk for psychosis. That means that they're starting to have some changes in their experiences and their beliefs around late adolescence that may portend a conversion to uh, full-blown psychosis. Not always and not in everybody. And we think perhaps by looking at these belief updating parameters across those individuals, this is actually a five site, site study that we're engaged in with our collaborators, where we'll try and identify individuals who we think are in that at-risk status and really follow carefully um, how their belief updating changes as they approach uh, a psychotic illness and indeed whether there are any protective factors that stop them from transitioning to psychosis. And our bet is that sensitivity to belief, uh, phasic information and phasic changes in belief um, that was much lower in people who had a full-blown psychotic illness may track that more severe trajectory shown in line C here. And again, that's something else that we're pretty actively following up on in the lab. I'm going to stop there and summarize and suggest to you that we've shown that clinical hallucinations involve strong prior beliefs as well as poor belief updating. I've shown you that poor belief updating in the general population and in paranoid patients is associated with um, uh, paranoia. Uh, we've identified some of the underlying circuitries using uh, computational cognitive neuroscience and that's really the sort of kernel of what we do in the lab. Uh, we're branching out and trying to modulate some of that to make causal conclusions using transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, some of the other projects which I haven't had a chance to mention, we're not just interested in drugs, uh, we're not just interested in uh, mechanical manipulations, there are things uh, that one can engage people with that might help with their psychotic symptoms that are sort of more non-traditional. One of the things that we're really fascinated by is music, I think it's inherently predictive, uh, and really taps into the same circuitry that's engaged uh, by and disrupted by psychosis. And so with a collaboration um, with uh, musical intervention here in New Haven, we're actually tracking the effect of making music in a group on people's psychotic symptoms and on their performance with this task. Again, we're gonna continue to explore the, continu the continuum of cognition, perception, and their disruption or disinteraction uh, in the general population and in people with psychotic illnesses. We're gonna branch out more socially, both in the paranoia sphere, but also exploring things like narcissism and self-deception uh, with a focus on high value decision makers. And one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is whether we can modulate people's expectations about themselves and other people uh, through the administration of empathogens and psychedelic drugs. I'm gonna stop there and thank the people in my lab. Not all of them are pictured in this photograph. Um, the people who really spearheaded the uh, belief updating work was Praveen Suhartharan and Erin uh, Reed. Um, and thank you all for your attention. I'm looking forward to meeting you.